Welcome back to the channel. My name is Kyle Martin, and I'm here today with the lovely Bella. She's off camera, but we should all give her a round of applause because this Q&A that we're gonna do came about because of her. She runs my Facebook and she put out the call for questions that people would like to have me answer on camera and people wrote questions in. It was really cool. And so today in this video, it's a different kind of video. It's something that we've never done on this channel, but it's something new. I'm just gonna answer these questions off the top of my head. We're not gonna do a video like this every week, but if you have any questions for me or if you have something that you wanna see me talk about in the future, just put it in the comments or you can reach me directly at kylemartinfineart at gmail.com. And thanks to all the people who submitted questions. I mean, it's really a cool thing to let me know that you all are out there and that, and that you're interested. I might have answers for your questions. We're gonna find out now. So this is from Carrie Corb. She says, I just heard about Fairfield Porter and his work made me think of yours. Who are your artistic influences? Hi, Carrie. Thank you for that really cool question. You saw the work of Fairfield Porter. You are on your way down the painting rabbit hole, and that's really good to hear. I love Fairfield Porter. My dog's name is Porter, named after Fairfield Porter, actually. Matt Holt and I both got dogs around the same time, and he named his dog after Andrew Wyeth, and I thought that was so cool, so I decided to name Porter Fairfield Porter after that artist. And I think that Fairfield Porter had a, a way of looking at the world and a way of, you know, simplifying the things that the natural world gave him. And he had such a strong voice within painting and to have my name brought up in combination with his really, really that's a nice compliment and I appreciate that. As far as Artists from the past, I love the, the French Impressionist movement, so people like Claude Monet. I love the post-impressionist movement. Post-impressionists like Paul Cezanne or Vincent van Gogh, Andre Durain, the famous Fauvism is a, is a movement that I take a lot of inspiration from. And also Soviet Impressionism. I think that the ideas of Impressionism reached the Soviet Union later than it did the rest of the world just because they were kind of secluded in a way during those years. By the time the Russians were able to solidify their idea of Impressionism, that's very inspiring to see. As far as people who are alive today, when I was in graphic design school, my teachers at MATC were all a bunch of landscape painters. Uh, Chris Gargan, John Ribble, Marlo Brenner, awesome landscape painters, all working directly from life. My first exploration into this world of painting from life was through seeing exhibitions from my teachers during those years. And so they've had just the, probably the largest impact on me. And then my friends through all this too. I'm talking Dan Corey, Matt Holt, and Josh has on the daily these people are inspiring me and a lot of times even when I'm out painting by myself I feel like those guys are all with me so it's just kind of a combination of my friends and teachers and our past art movements that really inspire me. Great question that's a really cool question. We'll talk about this more in the future as well. What are some key tips to building a more regular practice? That is a really good question. Of course, mileage in painting from life is the thing that is going to move your work in a positive direction better than anything else. One thing that I think would have helped me in the journey to establishing a painting practice is knowing the natural processes that your body goes through. For instance, I have only become aware of this within the past year or so, but Andrew Huberman is a professor of neurobiology at Stanford, and he gave a great talk on his podcast not long ago where he really explained the creative process. So here's the thing. You want to get out and paint as much as possible, whatever that is, three times a week, four times a week, every day, whatever it is, you want to be able to get outside and paint. When you 
decide that you're going to go out and paint, norepinephrine or a different adrenaline is released into your system. When norepinephrine or that adrenaline, that similar adrenaline is released into your system, that's a chemical that puts you in that fight or flight emotion in your system. And so getting started with painting is the hardest part because there's so much norepinephrine in your body. And it's at those moments where you make it out and you head out to paint and your car gets a flat tire or somebody calls you and they need your help or something like that. And that combined with norepinephrine makes it really hard to get started. Your easel blows over, um, your painting solvent spills out, your palette goes upside down. All these things, the cards are stacked against you at the beginning of the painting process. But at some point you start to mix colors and at some point you start to see the landscape a little bit more deeply or you cut through the, the noise and you start to have an experience. And when that happens, there's a different chemical that's released into your body. And that's what gives you that intense focus. It's that thing that makes you transcend and forget about time and just become one with the painting. Well, that's the chemical dopamine and it's the same chemical that keeps us scrolling endlessly on our cell phone looking for the next Instagram post. I think that you have to understand that you almost have to approach the painting session like it's going to be hard at the start of the session and, and just by knowing that you can kind of plan for that. So for me what does that mean? It means I try to keep my brushes clean and I try to keep my stuff like ready to go so that I'm not experiencing this feeling of the norepinephrine in my system, this fight or flight response that is gonna come from my system. I just have everything ready to go. And I try not to think too much about what I'm doing as I'm heading out to paint, but I know that the expectation should be that it's gonna be hard to get going, but that at some point you're going to start to feel really good during your painting session. And that point of connection is what we're all after. You just don't have it at the start of the painting session. And again, Andrew Huberman has spoken about this and you can also find references to this in the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, which is a really good book. Once you know the process, I think that you are able to structure a painting practice that is going to work for you. I think you should really be painting like four or five times a week. Um, you should definitely take a day or two off every week, but get out as much as possible. And as you progress with it, you're going to start to see things differently and things are going to become easier for you. The moment of starting a painting and staring at a blank canvas is never going to be easy. Don't think too much about it at the start and just get out there and do it and understand what your body is going through. Understand the rhythms of your body and that will help you to paint more. Also, the best time for you to paint is three hours after you wake up. It's just, that's the natural rhythm of your body and that's when you do your best work and it's when your body is ready to go and you should understand that as well. One last thing about your painting practice, go for really long walks or do something outdoors that's active. I think my best ideas come to me when I'm just on a walk with the dog. The walk that I take with Porter is four and a half miles long, so I'd say long walks is gonna help your painting practice as well. Take a couple of those things into consideration and let me know if that answers your question. When will you be showing slash talking about your transit van? Maybe we could do that next week. Yeah. It's too late to go out and film now probably. And we'd like to clean it up, but we have a really cool little camping van. Corbin and I built it and we gone out and spent a ton of nights in this little camper van and I've done a lot of paintings off the side of it. Actually this Friday's upload is going to be a road trip video. Maybe, maybe there's some footage of the camper van coming then, but maybe next week we'll do a little transit van, camper van video. What are you currently listening to? I listen to jazz when I paint mostly. I like the jazz crusaders. I like bebop music. I also have found a new hip-hop artist named Homeboy Sandman that I've been enjoying quite a bit. I like a lot of different music. I, li I listen to Charlie XCX a lot and I listen to jazz and 
I listened to Guided by Voices. We went to Modest Mouse this summer. That was so much fun. We had the best time. Bella has such great taste in music, so I, you know, she's like so trustworthy as far as like having music on in the car and stuff like that. We we're, were supposed to see Dinosaur Jr. this week, but they postponed that show. But I like hip hop and jazz, and I like indie music. Uh, rest in peace, two of my favorite rappers passed away this year. Black Alicious, Gift of Gab passed away. When I heard the album Blazing Arrow from Black Alicious, that changed my life. It was the first time that I was exposed to ideas of like more spiritual ideas like of your inner vibration and those kind of things that actually came through that record blazing arrow and also double k from people under the stairs rest in peace in 2021 as well he was one of my favorite rappers people under the stairs i listen to frank ocean a lot as well i like the old soul singers i like otis redding a lot I read about everything I could about all the different all the biographies of Otis Redding and I like those older soul singers, those Motown singers. You know, I grew up listening to AM radio in the barn, so it was like the oldies station it was really good. Uh, early rock and roll, like Chuck Berry, stuff like that. But I think Frank Ocean is a natural progression from those older Motown artists into the next. Chance the Rapper is good too. I like a lot of those kind of singers and rappers. Is there a resource you would recommend for learning more about color and value? Book, video, online course. Yeah, I think there there is some really good resources on color and value. I have some writings on color and value, and of course I do have some videos on my channel as well that do a good job explaining that topic. Uh, besides the stuff that I teach, I think that a really good book and just a fun read, a fun book to look at is Oil Painting to Develop Your Natural Ability by Charles Sovek. And that's kind of a workbook actually and it's full of pictures. It's a beautifully done book and I think that the lessons that he has in there definitely talks a lot about value and color. I'm sure you can find it for 10 bucks on Amazon. Also, there's a really good book on color called Color, How to See It, How to Paint It. And I can't remember the author's name. We'll put it up on the screen. I lend all my books out. I get so excited and then I, when people are talking about this stuff and then I just lend out my books and then I don't have them anymore so I can't show you. But that's a really interesting book. Of course, the Richard Schmidt book. He, it's, it's less of a, it gets really in-depth. So if you're ready for something a little more in-depth, I'd say check out the Richard Schmidt book, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting, covers all that stuff. I will say that my work as a graphic designer has led me to really break down the landscape and focus on the fundamentals of value and color. And as this channel progresses, I'm gonna be sharing more of that stuff with you as well. There's a free document floating around the internet. It's Sergei Baumgart's Notes on Painting, something like that. The great colorist, you know, I'm so inspired by Claude Monet and the lineage kind of went Claude Monet, William Merritt Chase to Hawthorne to Henry Henschy and then Henschy kind of dispersed the knowledge of Monet's Impressionism to uh, the painters who are alive now. And there is a PDF available on Camille Przewodnik's website that is kind of the working methods of Henry Henschy. That is a fantastic document on color. I've long been a fan of the Henschy kind of style of colorism and I love that stuff. It's very deep, it's very, it's pretty in-depth stuff. So depending on where you are and what questions you have, I think I've listed off some, some of my favorite resources or some resources that I've looked into. And I think just keep, just keep looking because everywhere that you look, you're gonna find one little piece of information. It takes a lot of grains of sand to make a beach. So just keep searching and keep that, keep that passion alive and keep that search alive because at the end of the day, that's what 
being a painter is, is just keeping the art spirit alive, the spirit of discovery and that spirit of things that are new and the spirit of the landscape. And once you do all those things, the paintings just roll off the brush. I want to thank you all for submitting questions. That was a lot of fun and we'll do it again soon. So let me know in the comments, do you have any more questions or things that I should talk about? Next week, we're going to try and do a Transit Connect video and show off our van, but maybe we could answer a couple of questions in the van. So I'm Kyle. Bella put this all together. She's fantastic. Thanks so much. And we'll see you guys on Friday for another plein air painting adventure video.